The pitch at Taunton has a nickname, Cider Bat, because the ball spins there and because they have cider down there. And this has led to a very interesting thing. For the first three tests of their Asian adventure, their two spinners were both from Somerset. This is a proud achievement for a small county and they earned it by producing pitches that actually spin. But these pitches spin so much that they have been penalized by the ECB for making the ball turn. Yes, this is a thing that happened. Somerset lost points for creating the only two spin threats under 30 that England has. It is the most English cricket thing in recent times. It is like shooting yourself in the foot and then finding yourself for taking the bullet out. I tap my friend Umul Dasse again to have a look at just how much Taunton turns. And it, it does. In the last 10 years of first class cricket, teams have used spinners 40% of the time there. It's comfortably England's number one spinning venue. Being that the average is 22% in county cricket, that's quite extreme. But of the 124 most used first class grounds in the world, that would rank at, um, uh, we're almost there, any second now, 60th. The most spinning pitch in the UK is not even spinning by world standards. The oval is the next best UK pitch at 81st. This isn't just a thing for England. At one end you have Asia with a few West Indian pitches and at the other end you have the majority of the scenic countries. Growing up in England is not an ideal place to become a spinner. It has been hard to find spinners for England since Graham Swan. And it was pretty much hard before Graham Swan. This is the entire list of English spinners with over 25 wickets to their name. You can see Leach in the middle of the table and he only started a couple of years ago and has been 12th man more than he's actually been in the team. And just for context and because it's a little bit funny, let me be slightly unfair and add someone to this list. Eerily. I add him because it's funny, but I also add him because he has taken more wickets than the top three England spinners combined. And I know how much of this is conditions dependent. England don't have great conditions for spinners. And because of that, they don't create spinners. And because of that, they don't learn about spin. And because of that, they ruin spinners when they can. And sometimes they penalize the county that produces spinners in the first place. England has had 12 spinners since Graham Spawn. One of those is now trying to be a lawyer. And worse still, another one is a batsman. None of this is helped by the fact that England think their spinners need to be able to bat as well. You'd think a country with 17 keeping and 24 seam bowling all-rounders would be less keen on a spinning all-rounder. But Bess's rise is at least in part because he is handy with the bat. You wonder now if they'd have picked Graham Swan at that age if it wasn't for the fact that he could also bat a bit. And that brings us to the three current England spinners in this series in India. They're all fascinating in different ways. Don Bess is certainly a learn-to-bat guy. I've been fascinated with Bess for a while because he kind of doesn't make sense. He doesn't spin the ball that much. He doesn't get that much bounce. He's not that accurate. And yet he's also definitely not a terrible spin option. And so far, considering the fact he came in very young and partly because he could bat, he's bowled very well at test level. But some weird things have been going on with Bess recently. So the first place I started is with CrickViz. And while everyone else wanted to know Dom Bess's expected average using the CrickViz method, I actually wanted to know how often he bowled full tosses. They told me of finger spinners with more than 2,000 balls in their database. Only Suleiman Ben and Marlon Samuels bowled more full tosses per wicket. Ben is 200 centimetres tall, and you would assume he bowled a fuller length than most normal heighted spinners. Samuels was a part-timer who averaged 59 with the ball. That's not the company that Bess wants to find himself in. And to be honest, I've been obsessed about this for a long time, probably since he was bowling in South Africa. But in the first innings of the first test against India, it was very clear even as he took wickets. Here are the three off spinners from their first innings of that test. Generally bowling to right handers is tougher for off spinners and so they have to be even more accurate and even more careful. You can see that not only is Best the fullest of the offies, he's also the shortest. Sundar is less experienced than Best and taller so we expect him to be slightly fuller but he's not there. And even when you look at them to left handers, have a look at Bess's lengths again, they're kind of all over the shot. You would think this is where he feels he's most confident as he has a tactical advantage over the left-handed. It's also worth noting just how accurate Ravi Chandran Ashwin is. He rarely bowls full tosses according to Crick Fierce, and these maps show just how much he can drop the ball exactly where he wants when he needs to. But Ashwin is so in charge of what he does that he also varies it a little bit. I want to show you the most elite of the elitist. Nathan Lyon is the most accurate off spinner in the world from all the pitch maps I've ever seen, which if that is an evidence, I just don't know what is. Mm. Drink that in. It is tough to be a successful finger spinner, especially if you don't have control of your line or your length. 
Some wrist spinners can get away with it slightly, but finger spinners are supposed to keep the pressure on. And that is hard when you're bowling regular full or short balls. Now, if you're trying to remember Bess's recent form, he has taken 17 wickets in his last three tests in Asia, which makes what England did in dropping him a kind of remarkable thing. But it's worth going back over some of his wickets versus Sri Lanka. He took a wicket early on day one against Sri Lanka with a reverse sweep that went straight to slip. I mean, there's a little bit of luck there. His next wicket, he dropped the ball short and then it spun wide and the batsman cut it straight to point. After that, a batsman middled a sweep shot right into Johnny Bairstow's ass, and it bounces up in the air despite hitting the lower ass. And because of that, it went very close to the slips and keeper, and it was easily gobbled up for a catch. And then he's delivered a half volley that was somehow missed completely. And if you want to know what kind of form Joe Root is, if you look here, there's a slight smile on his face. He can actually tell at this point that the batsman is going to miss that ball. That's how well he was seeing them. That was all in one innings for Bess. I haven't gone through all the other innings to see if there was any other lucky there. That was an incredible run. But then he played against India and he took four wickets in the first innings there. And he took two amazingly lucky wickets again. The first was Ajinkya Rahane's wicket. So it was a full toss. And not just a full toss, but a low full toss. And not just a low full toss, a wide low full toss. And somehow Rahane managed to get his bat under it and scoop it up which is already an element of luck for Bess. Then there is an absolutely fantastic catch. It's probably only caught, what, 20% of the time? And if you double that up with the fact that a low full toss was somehow scooped up in the air, it is a freakish dismissal. And it wasn't even the weirdest one that he took. The weirdest one was when he dropped short to Bajara, and the ball was short. Bajara made it look even worse by getting far back in his crease, and he absolutely smashed a pull shot that should have gone out to the boundary for four, at the very worst, gone to a sweeper. Sadly for him, it hits the middle of Ollie Pope's back and balloons up in the air. And of course, it could have ballooned in any direction. It somehow just makes a V-line for exactly where Rory Burns was standing. And let's be very clear here. Rory Burns, not only would the ball probably not have carried to Rory Burns, there is absolutely no way the ball was going anywhere near Rory Burns when it was hit originally. And you wouldn't even have someone fielding where Rory Burns was fielding that, that often. And everything went right for Dominic Best here to get a wicket. So that is six of the 17 wickets Best has taken in that productive period, which have come through kind of no skill of his own. We're going to have to start calling him Domino Best. But there is one thing that Don Bess is slightly unlucky. The chairman of selection of English cricket, Ed Smith, once wrote a book about luck. I haven't read the book, but I'm assuming he kind of gets it. And if he kind of gets luck, there is no way you could look at what Don Bess has done and not think to yourself, I'm not sure this is going to last. It's the one thing we don't like to talk about that much in sports. We like to live in the fantasy that the team who wanted it more, or who played better wins. But luck has a huge role in cricket especially, and Don Best has been living that, right up until the point that they dropped him. But it would be unfair to say that Best didn't take any other wickets. In the middle of all this, he also took the wicket of Virat Kohli. But in the second innings, when he bowled to Virat Kohli, he bowled three consecutive full tosses and had to be taken out of the attack. That is where Don Best currently is. He's not a terrible bowler. His economy rate in tests is 2.9. And if you watched him while he was 12th man in the second test, you could see that all day he was speaking to Jeet and Patel, England spin bowling coach. Almost every time the camera was on the balcony, they were in deep conversation about something technical or something tactical. And you have to remember that Best is a young spinner and he's not a complete bowler yet. In fact, I think he just needs to bowl more. For most of his professional career, he was the second spinner in his county side. And that's because the first spinner in his county side was Jack Leach. Leach, who has some elite bowling skills of his own, and he's averaging just over 30 in test cricket. He's certainly a quality bowler, but with some very extreme limitations. Part of the reason that Leach is so good is because he has sent so many balls down at side about in Taunton. But the thing is, he has actually struggled when he's been away from Taunton. He is a brilliant bowler in Taunton and an average bowler where he goes everywhere else. Now, if you factor that into test cricket, he's obviously going to be away from the side about like all the time. And also, the pitches usually hold up better over the first couple of days outside of Asia. So it doesn't bring spinners in. And you can see from his average in the first innings that he really does struggle when he's bowling on flat pitches. 
and even when he was bowling at side of bat, is he has always struggled against left-handers. But as he's gone up to test level, he's had a lot more trouble with left-handers. And not only does he not get them out, but they also score off him easily. They have no fear from him at all. And he hasn't put any pressure on them. Again, this doesn't make Leach a bad bowler. He's brilliant when he spins against right-hander. And for a spinner, that is a pretty handy thing to be good at. But the limitations cause other problems. Unlike other spinners around the world with roughly the same amount of skill as him, you can't just plug and play him in from one end all day. There's also many other issues when it comes to Jack Leach. England turned him into a cult figure with a bat in 2019 when he won two tests, but his limitations were shown up when a pitch didn't spin and that happened to clash with Mitchell Santner's left-handedness. He then got very sick in South Africa, when he was most definitely not going to play anyway. And when he finally recovered, he became a non-playing bubble boy. Finally, he gets out in the field in Sri Lanka, and the batsmen are trying to make Best look like a frontline spinner ahead of him. And then when he goes up against India, Rishabh Pant is going absolutely crazy and tries to end him forever. So I have this dream for Jack Leach, and it involves Stuart McGill, and already I'm regretting putting those two things in the same sentence. What Jack Leach needs is the SCGM treatment. Those are Stuart McGill's initials, in case you didn't know. But essentially, if you look at Stuart McGill's career record, you're just like, wait, that's incredible. Because Australia already had a great spinner in Shane Warne. So when Stuart McGill played, he was only playing when the conditions were completely in his favor, when Australia was so desperate that they would use two spinners. Having looked at Stuart McGill's record before, and he's very good against the tail and not so good against the top order. He needed that extra assistance. Had he played against everyone, he would have had a far more ordinary record. Now, if you ask Stuart McGill or Jack Leach, of course they would want to play in every game. But to get the most out of them, maybe the best thing to do is to say to Jack Leach, you don't need to play in every game. You don't need to go on every tour. But in the conditions that we think will suit you, like against right-handers or on pitches that are ragging sideways, we will always pick you. You'll be the first name on the team sheet. Well, not the first name on the team sheet. Obviously, Ben Folks will be the first name on the team sheet. Jack Leach is still quite young for a spinner, and he might develop, and he might end up being someone you can use on all surfaces against all kind of batsmen. That is fine. But until he is that, Maybe one of the best things England can do is just to use him perfectly. And then when he's not playing, send him to places where the ball doesn't spin. Send him to places where there's lots of left-handers. I don't know if there is such a place, but if there was. Make him better at all the things he's not good at, and then pick him for the things he's already good at. But let me just make it very clear. Essentially, when this happens, Jack Leach is one of the best bowlers in the world. And when this, and sometimes this happen, he is not. Then you have Moeen Ali, who replaced Don Best because of his lack of control for the second test, and then straight away, this happened. And sadly, this was not the only full toss that Moen bowled. He bowled seven on the first day, and a few drag downs as well, which is kind of what you expect for a bowler who's only played two first class matches since 2019. But going for runs, and on, the, on day one he went at 4.3 and over, is something that Moen Ali kind of always does. Here is the list of all the bowlers in the last 10 years to take 100 wickets by average and runs per over. There are no bad bowlers on this list. To take 100 test wickets is a phenomenal effort. And most of the non-elite off spinners in the world end up with quite poor bowling averages over time. The problem is that Moen Ali pairs a poor bowling average with a terrible economy rate. You can see from there is no other successful bowler out there like him. And remember, he was a batsman and part-time bowler for the first six years of his professional career. He only started bowling frontline spin overs in 2012, and by 2014, he was in the test team. Moeen has taken 183 wickets, which is amazing, but that doesn't mean he's an incredible bowler. On day one of the second test, he put the ball everywhere. He's an average bowler who occasionally delivers incredible balls. He doesn't have good control, and you can see from this, he's just kind of all over the place. But the thing about Moeen Ali is, he has the ability to bowl the worst ball you've seen, or one of the best. England has the ability to produce the best deliveries by spinners, but not the best spinners. 